Uh, so, uh, on uh, behalf of the host uh, here, Google Earth Office, I, uh, I would like to welcome you all. I hope you enjoy uh, your time in our office. I hope everyone has budgets. You know, we uh, at Google here are also very interested in AI and growing that uh, effort. So, we'll be very uh, interested in um, hearing the, we have some Googlers here also uh, attending. So, thank you for being with us. Hello everyone, thanks for coming uh, for the episode 5 of Warsaw AI. It's amazing, we met for the first time one year ago, almost exactly one year ago. Uh, the event today is hosted and sponsored by Google, so we are very happy that we can be here. So thanks Google. And uh, here we have three amazing speakers, Krzysztof Rządca, Staszek Jastrzemski, Przemek Biacek. Uh, so, yeah, without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, uh, Krzysztof Rządca from Google and University of Warsaw. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, so let me switch the room tab. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the link is very sensitive. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you for, for inviting me here. Uh, so my name is Krzysztof Rządca. I'm currently working as a visiting researcher here in Google Warsaw. Uh, when I'm not visiting Google, I'm uh, associate professor in the Institute of Computer Science uh, in University of Warsaw. Uh, I will present today a rather unusual application of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Because when you think about machine learning at Google, uh, you typically think about uh, applications such as search or uh, image recognition or DeepMind winning the game of Go. Uh, I will try to convince you today that infrastructure uh, which we work on uh, here in Warsaw is a very nice application area for uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have lots of data uh, that we can use for learning and then uh, the stakes are huge so obviously with, with the scale of resources we have here if you optimize something by one percent the uh, implications are enormous implications in terms of, of uh, computing power saved uh, carbon footprint reduced and so on so on um, so let me start by taking you on a journey back in time, 20 years ago. Uh, Matrix is in cinemas and we are in, in a full-fledged dot-com bubble. And as you can see, everyone is using Drop Shadow on their web pages. And uh, Google is booming too. Uh, we, we have exponential uh, increase in number of users, um, although we are still in beta. Uh, so this was our front end back then. Perhaps most, more incredibly, this was what served Google 20 years ago for the whole planet. It's, it's the first Google uh, ser uh, server rack that is now proudly presented in the Computing History Museum in, in uh, Mountain View in <laughs> California. And uh, as you can see, there are like very, very few machines for uh, delivering you know, the search service for the whole planet. And, uh, uh, and when you think about it, I mean, it's not so difficult to manage like, like you know, a handful of machines, right? You, uh, if you have a few machines, you tend to get like quite personal with them. Or you, I mean, probably everyone here has his or her own uh, favorite naming scheme. And you're very aware of what each machine does, a bit like you know pets in a in a household. So uh, I have a colleague at my faculty who has a few uh, you know, big machines with with uh, GPUs, and uh, I ask him to to grant my um, students from my course to to use these machines, and uh, one of these machines, and I ask him. Uh, hey, will you, will you let us to use Arnold for the next two months? And he said, well, Arnold is quite busy, but uh, Sylvester is still free. And if not, we can, you can always use Chuck. And <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, the problem is, yeah, uh, fast forward 20 years. Uh, uh, so you can see that our front page is much clearer now, and we got rid of the shadow. 
uh, but the the backend changed considerably too. Uh, we now have like dozen data centers, and this is the inside look of in one of them. And you can imagine that like managing resources on such a scale is much more difficult. I mean, you you can't. Uh, any longer pretend that you will put you know front end on first track and the back end on the second track and the uh, search engine on the on the middle rack you you need to be much more fine grained to assign uh, individual jobs to to individual resources uh, so uh, obviously we, uh, we we need software that uh, that manages this for us and uh, we have uh, such a standard scheduler, it's called Borg. And basically, the, so the idea is uh, the following. Uh, so even if you're a Googler, you can't just go and SSH into a machine, you know, like the, the middle machine, the front, end, the front rack on this uh, uh, data center. You have to define your job in, uh, as a Borg job, and then you ask Borg scheduler to uh, find a machine for you to, to execute this job. And uh, this, uh, uh, so our architecture is uh, quite simple. We have like um, Borg master that, that is this scheduler to, that places uh, jobs on machines. And then we have Borglets on each machine that accept jobs and also report back the state to, to, the, to the master scheduler. And basically, Borg, the, the, the role of Borg is to take care of, of the job life cycle, so to, to report when the job finished or report when the job uh, aborted or so on and so on. Uh, uh, let's look at the jobs that we are actually placed. So these, these are like high level overview of what's actually happening. So imagine uh, we have tasks so jobs are a collection of tasks, right? And uh, the idea is that jobs has uh, tasks have to be isolated from each other to be sure that first of all we uh, each uh, task has uh, like uh, uh, pretends that has a machine for its own, but also uh, to to have a predictable performance for uh, for each task. And we do this by packing individual tasks into containers, uh, and containers have sizes. Uh, so we can say that, the con let's say we have a task that uh, does some transcoding of YouTube videos, and it, this, this tasks, the, this unit task that processes, for instance, one video at the, at the time, requires four cores and one gigabyte of memory. And we have another task that uh, serves Google Docs documents that require two cores and three gigabytes of memory, and another task that serves, uh, s uh, that stores something from Gmail that requires one core and three gigabytes of memory. And uh, now the, uh, when we know how much task, how much resources a task requires, <coughs> we, we can pack tasks into, onto physical machines. So, and this is again about uh, performance, isola uh, about isolating the impact of task onto uh, other tasks. So if a task says, says that it requires eight cores and we would like to put it in a machine that has to just two free cores, obviously it, it won't have enough processing capacity. So the pro performance would degrade. So we would rather not do this because we would like to have uh, predictable performance. We'd like to know that, uh, that the serving task would serve a certain number of uh, users concurrently with an acceptable latency of, of handling user queries and so on and so on. Um, so uh, seems easy, like seems, seems like bin packing. Uh, the problem is that these uh, resource limits are very hard to set because actually I cheated a, a bit on the last two slides, where I presented you, you know, this, this nice round numbers of four cores and, and four gigabytes of memory. And I mean, if you're a client of, of a cloud provider, you usually rent a virtual machine that has this 
very precise limits on, on the number of cores or number of, uh, on the memory size. But inside, our limits are much more fine-grained. You can see here a cumulative distribution function of, of limits on, uh, of actual jobs running on Borg. Uh, these are uh, CPU limits and, and memory limits. And you see that there are very few uh, like uh, round numbers that we could use to round these, these things down to. And uh, this, uh, and you can see also that this, this distribution spans from uh, 10 millicores to roughly 1,000 cores. So uh, uh, it's quite dense. The problem is that, uh, yeah, you as a Google engineer, when you submit your job to 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 work to to, to execute, you have to. Uh, previously you had to guess this number uh, these numbers correctly and uh, act this is very hard because uh, yeah for instance th this is a job that is currently running on on Google Cloud right, this presentation and it's very hard to guess how much memory this thing requires now or how much processing power it requires when I click a uh, click on a slide and uh, because usually, you know, as, as end users, we become aware of how much uh, resources we need when we hit the limits, right? When we, we know that we can process a data set on, on our computer data set that has 100 gigabytes, but we can't that ha uh, process something that has one terabyte. So, the, but the problem here is that the, our jobs, as you saw in the previous slide, are much smaller on the, on the usual case. Uh, luckily, uh, we have lots of data here, and uh, obviously I can't tell you how much data we have, but I mean, for me, working here as a visiting researcher, it's like, you know, a kid in a candy store. What I can tell you about is a pub one of public data sets that we released a few years ago that shows uh, precise usage logs from, uh, from one of our clusters for an entire month. And you can see that there are like 25 million tasks in these data sets and each task reports for each five minutes of it life, if its lifetime um, some statistics on, on CPU usage and some statistics on memory usage. So uh, you can imagine that internally our data set is even richer. And uh, what uh, basically Autopilot does is to use this data on historic uh, uh, historic performance of jobs to guess the future limits the job should have and uh, the the tool is actually I mean conceptually it's quite easy we have this data store uh, where we store usage metrics and we have a few different predictors and I will tell you about these two first heuristics and machine learning predictor then for a, for a job uh, it's particular per predictor uh, pixel limit, this limit goes to, to the actuator and the actuator sets this limit on Borg and then we hope that this limit is precise enough so that we save resources but we don't starve the job. And uh, also uh, this tool was built mostly here, so this is like one of the uh, major products this, this office had uh, on, in the Google infrastructure. So. If you work here, you can have like really big impact on what we do in the Google infrastructure. Uh, ju I just want to uh, emphasize that the stakes are very high because we can we can do two types of problems. And the obvious problem is that uh, yeah we we set a limit on a job that to, that is small, but Suddenly, job requires much more than 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 uh, the, uh, it, it limit, and then uh, we run out of resources. And if this resource is is uh, memory, we are in trouble because basically we don't have swap disks on on our computers. So basically, you run out of memory. Then you run out of memory. You have to kill something. And uh, if you if you kill a job. Uh, that serves users, these users uh, suddenly see that um, their uh, response time is suddenly increased, so something is wrong. Uh, 
the other type of problem is an under allocated machine. So this machine that you can see on the left uh, is I mean, act the number of resources that are actually used are uh, small compared to what was declared or what was set as a limit uh, by, by autopilot. And this leads to, I mean, when you multiply this by, by the scale of resources we have here, this leads, leads, leads to a uh, more uh, considerable loss. And uh, so, uh, again, just to uh, emphasize, like, uh, machine learning is more or less uh, about yeah, finding the right balance between efficiency and, and reliability, right? And uh, in like more standard applications, this this uh, point between you know uh, error rate and learning rate is uh, somewhat higher than wh what we require uh, in the infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, like historic uh, development of the error rate for for ImageNet uh, competition. So basically, for, for those of you who don't know this, ImageNet is like a standard data set that, uh, that was used for, um, for uh, assigning labels to, to pictures. And uh, it was used as like the standard data set since the 2011. And then in 2017, uh, it occurred that majority, it was a competition, and in 2017, majority of, of uh, teams that entered this competition had an error rate of less than 5%. And the organizers said, okay, we are done. It does not, does not make sense to optimize any further because 5% seems like uh, uh, an error rate that is almost perfect. And uh, just to give you like uh, an example uh, and, and uh, I, I'm aware that it's not entirely apples to apples comparison. Like imagine a car that has 5% error rate. So each time you, you try to go like in the morning to, to your job, uh, you have 5% probability that this car won't, uh, uh, won't start. Uh, it's not something that would, uh, yeah, that would you would rely on, and uh, the picture is uh, the picture is Deutsche Logan, which is according to, to to some standard European ranking of reliability, it's the Europe's most unreliable car. It has an error rate of 15 percent, and the can guess what well, what was the time frame for this 15 percent. Two, three years, right? So, uh, like, f over the first three years of Dacia Logan's lifetime, 15% of Dacia Logan's had some serious problems that uh, made this car uh, 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 unreliable. But still, it's 15% over three years, not 5% over a week. Um, and again, autopilot, is somewhere at the bottom of our software stack. I mean, it controls uh, uh, it controls jobs that run uh, and deliver their own services that they have they have very pre uh, uh, precise service level objectives. So they, they these jobs require much more reliability than this five percent that uh, that we have here in ImageNet. And so how do we do this? In the first version, uh, we, we did like simple statistics on, on a signal. So basically you can, uh, you can imagine that, this, that uh, let's say CPU usage for, from a particular job is a signal. And then you can use these standard signal processing tools to uh, process this signal into, into a limit. And Basically, what, what we did, we, we, we ran a, a sliding window, and then we computed some statistics over, over this sliding window. Like, you can see here that there, there is a spike in the, uh, at the first hour, and the, our, our task goes from 0.6 CPUs to 1 CPU. 
and then you, uh, the, these sliding windows uh, gradually pick this change and uh, like scale the, the uh, limit up and basically based on the percentile you, you react faster or slower. Uh, the problem is uh, jobs have different characteristics. So you can have jobs that, that are pretty stable and then uh, if a job is stable and it starts to require uh, higher uh, uh, CPU count, for instance, it is reasonable that uh, assumption that we should increase this limit. Uh, but you can have also jobs that are very like noisy and that or they are periodic that they scale up then are up for for like five minutes then then are down for like running five, 55 minutes so it's it seemed that for each this type of job we would have to find uh, like sensible parameters for for the sliding window length for the percentile we, we used to, to uh, drive the whole thing or for, uh, for the uh, dumping factor when, when the job scales down, how fast we should go, uh, make the, lim uh, how fast uh, down should the limit go. So uh, here we used machine learning. Basically, uh, the, mo the method we use is quite simple. It, it's based on reinforcement learning. The idea is that we have models, uh, multiple models for each job, and one of these models will drive the, the actual setting of the limit. And uh, these models are parameterized by, by some parameters here, decay rate, but we have a few of them. And each inside the model, we compute cost function for each for many possible limits, and and this cost function takes into account like uh, historical uh, historical usage of uh, and historical uh, uh, pr precision of this limit versus the actual usage. And then sometimes the model might, might change the limit. We, we have another, uh, a penalty for doing so because if you change the limits too, too, quickly, too, too often, uh, you might uh, run out of, a resource, of resources on the machine, so you need to, to kill some, some jobs. Uh, and then we, uh, so this happens inside the model. And then we have a, like a meta cost function that picks a model according to from 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 this ensemble of models according to again historical uh, performance of each of the models, uh, how often the, the model changed the limit, how often we would uh, um, change the model, and so on, so on. So uh, also perhaps more importantly, we are using standard. ML approach to optimize this thing. So we have trainings, training and an evaluation set that are like uh, based on representative jobs. Uh, we have uh, a procedure to test new versions of these algorithms. And uh, yeah, and okay. Uh, general, I can't say much more now, but there is a paper coming, uh, hopefully in, in the next few weeks, so stay tuned. And also for, for so actual numbers. Um, uh, just to summarize, uh, yeah, before I summarize, uh, Autopilot is a huge project here, and uh, Borg, so the thing that Autopilot works in, is uh, even larger. So uh, these, these people helped me considerably in doing this presentation, also writing paper. Um, to, to summarize, uh, first of all, we have huge computers here. And uh, at this scale, uh, first of all, uh, the gains that you do, even small gains, translate into uh, actual savings. And playing with these huge computers is, is really fun. And, uh, Secondly, efficient job scheduling requires very fine-grained control so uh, over the, the resource limits. So we can't just say, hey, uh, this job 
uh, usually it takes less than 50 cars, so let's put the limit of, on 50 because we would have mm, to have mm, even more data centers that we that uh, we have now. And uh, we have lots of data, and if uh, if you're interested in playing with this data, you can Google for, for, for our publicly available cluster trace. And uh, uh, Autopilot uses uh, past data on past resource usage to drive future scheduling decisions, to drive limits, then that in turn drive the scheduling decisions. Right, thanks. Sarah. Um, Christoph, do you have any questions to Krzysiek? Okay. Um, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering, so is this or other machine learning or reinforcement learning approaches used currently in job scheduling? They are. They are, and they are, they, I mean, I can't say how right. much, how many percents or so on, but uh, it's significant. Right. Cool, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So this is kind of a black box approach, yeah, because you don't know like the code or anything about the task. Yeah. Uh, do you have non-black box approaches too? Uh, I, I, okay, I, I think I can't answer this, but you're right that this is a black box approach. But at our, I would say that at our scale, uh, opening the box is, I mean, we, are, we have so many types of jobs that opening these boxes to, to look at what's inside would be valuable probably for like just, you know, a minority of jobs that take the majority of resources. I'm not sure about, uh, you know, the distribution of the actual usage, whether I mean the, the largest 10 jobs, whether they take uh, I don't know, uh, 1 percent or 50 percent of our res resources, but I, I would imagine that it's more fine-grained than, than 50 percent and that the black box, appro black box uh, approach should, must be sufficient. Yeah. I think that we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, thank you for a very interesting talk. So I have a question regarding the model. Uh -huh. I don't know if you could answer. Uh, is there an explanation or maybe intuition on why an ensemble of models works better than a single very powerful model? Uh, so the, the intuition is that these models roughly correspond, I mean, the idea was that a model roughly corresponds to, to a category of jobs. So, uh, maybe it was kind of easier to understand for for like for people who uh, for for us to to uh, to 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 I mean during this this test that we we did to to kind of associate you know that that model for a particular decay rate describes well. Uh, latency sensitive uh, secondary jobs uh, produced uh, for by YouTube right? and model with that degree rate uh, corresponds better to another type of jobs. I would say that this. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, well, you have opportunity to ask more questions to just have during the after party. Yeah. After no, last I'll lecture, she should be here. Pizza. Okay, great. So I, I saw that there are more questions probably, but well, we have to uh, go further. And uh, so let's uh, thank once again, uh, Krzysztof for great talk. Okay. So let's welcome our next great speaker, Stanisław Jastrzemski, who uh, arrived from New York, from US, New York University. He's a postdoc there. So welcome, Stanisław. OK, hello, everyone. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. Very happy to be here. Um, I'll be talking today about optimization and generalization in deep learning, so 
quite a different uh, topic. I will start with some background. So in deep learning, the choice of optimization methods seems to affect generalization in very non-obvious ways. So if you pick a different optimization method, you will arrive at a different generalization, even though you achieve in all cases the same training accuracy. This is in stark contrast to what happens in shallow learning, at least typically. Um, the, there, the let's say, goal of optimization is to find the minimum, the perfect training accuracy. Uh, and choice of uh, optimization method shouldn't affect, in theory, the generalization of the method, of the network. Uh, here we have different learning curves on the test set. Uh, on CIFAR 100, and you can see the color where color is optimization method, uh, changes in terms of the result, differs in terms of uh, accuracy achieved. So in this time we'll look into why this might be the case. It is a very interesting scientific question. It also has um, more practical implications. So perhaps a bit uh, of a hypothesis. I will come back to this at the end of the talk. But the challenge, the, the fact that optimization and generalization are so entangled in deep learning also ma makes difficult uh, using deep learning in some uh, more challenging settings. For instance, uh, uh, this is a slide from Tesla presentation, multitask learning. And they complain a lot there that having all of these objectives, such as detecting lanes or objects or persons in the, in the camera, uh, makes for a very, very difficult uh, optimization problem. As I said, this is, and some other problems like this, are also another motivation for, how, for why should we study the link between optimization and generalization deep learning. So some background. We will study mostly stochastic gradient descent, but it's not exactly specific to stochastic gradient descent. It is an iterative algorithm. In each step, we'll change the current, par current parameters using uh, a an estimate of the gradient that's computed on a mini batch of size s and multiply it by a learning rate denoted by eta, which tells you how large or how small is the step. Um, this is the visualization of the trajectory. Uh, the SGD trajectory is plotted in red color. You can see it's stochastic. So sometimes it will go sideways, sometimes it will go up, sometimes it will take a too large step. Now, interestingly, the more stochastic it is, the better deep networks work. So the slower you are in optimization or the more variance you have in your gradient, the better your network will be. This is in stark contrast to typical optimization where the goal is to just zoom into the minima and be fine. This is contrasted with gradient descent, which is just taking the accurate step. And gradient descent doesn't optimize well deep networks in the sense that it will overfit. Question is why? Um, so we are now ready to uh, go to the main part of the talk. So I will describe some of our new research on the topic. <coughs> and we'll, I will try to present our new perspective on how optimization and generalization are related. Long story short, um, the choice of optimization method really changes the trajectory in the loss surface. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start with, um, all right. So this is um, coming from many papers with uh, many great collaborators. I will just focus on our recent paper from iClear and a submission to this year iClear. OK, so let's start with a simpler question. Why does learning rate matter for generalization? So there is a, there is a deep learning book. Um, there is a deep learning textbook uh, called Deep Learning Book, right? Something like that, where you can read the following. The learning rate is perhaps the most important hyperparameter. If you have time to tune only one hyperparameter, uh, tune the learning rate. Uh, let me first give you some experimental data for that. So here, each dot is a model trained to perfect training accuracy, I think on FashionList, uh, which is a simple data set. And on x-axis, we have learning rate, actually normalized by batch size, but that's not very important. And y-axis, we have generalization performance. And you can see there is, uh, there is uh, a linear correlation in this case, um, which is, well, as I said, uh, from optimization perspective, um, quite weird. So we, should, we would expect normally this to be a horizontal line, that if you get perfect training accuracy, the generalization shouldn't change. So why is it the case? Um, perhaps a hint comes from examining how the minima looks. Um, so here, imagine that we approximate the minima at the end with a parabola. 
So if you have a white, white, when I say that we have a white minima, I mean that the parabola is white, or more technically speaking, Hessian, which is second order derivative at the minimum, um, has low norm. And when I say the minima is narrow, I mean that the parabola is narrow, or more technically speaking, the Hessian has um, a high norm. Now, if you do the same experiment, but now on y-axis we'll have um, the Hessian norm, we see an anti-correlation. So in this case, actually, when you use a high learning rate, it will select a very wide minimum. Uh, thinking about this, uh, it's quite intuitive. So if we take huge steps in the loss surface, we actually should jump out of very thin minimum. Makes sense. But the story is more interesting. If you look at the curvature along the trajectory, we see that a large learning rate actually selects this wide regions of the lost surface very early on. So this is training on CIFAR-10, which is also a simple data set. On x-axis, we have epoch. Pay attention that the first two epochs are scaled up just to show the dynamics in learning that typically are omitted from uh, just an, an experimental uh, um, from experiments. Typically, people just keep them. But actually, there's a lot of interesting things happening here. And colors are different learning rates. And um, the y-axis is the minima width. So, or like I should say curvature. So if this is low on this axis, the loss surface is very smooth or white. And if it is very high on this scale, and note it is logarithmic, the loss surface is very thin on nar or narrow along the top direction. This is the spectral node. So now just looking at this plot, we see that just in under one epoch, the highest learning rate stabilizes curvature. So it's not that we select the wide minimum. It's actually that from the very beginning, we just go to another part of the lost surface, and we never see large curvature regions. I think it's better or easier to, visual, um, to describe this by, by visualization. So here we have two, two trajectories in the lost surface. Um, each dot is an iteration of optimization. And the embedding, and that's a cool technical fact, is done in this way that for each iteration, we make predictions on all examples on, on the test set, and we embed this using like TSNI or a related algorithm. As I said, color is learning rate. So we can see that initially, two trajectories are following each other. But when you use a high learning rate, which is the red color, it just deflects. It won't go into that region where blue goes. And now I should tell you what is the color. So color is the curvature. So what seems to happen is that when training goes to uh, this very high, uh, like medium curved regions, for high learning, it will just escape them. And it won't ever enter this part of the lost surface. Now, most importantly, this happens very early on. Um, it's actually like 40% accuracy, which on CIFAR 10 that has 10 classes is relatively low. So for most of the trajectory, high learning rate optimizes in a very wide part of the lost surface. And first, like takeaway, is that using high learning rate is improving conditioning of learning from the perspective of if there are optimization inclined people here. Um, we want actually smooth loss surface. It's easier to optimize under some extra considerations. Um, and actually, this happens automatically when you use a high learning rate. You just will ignore badly conditioned parts of the loss surface. OK. Um, so the point at which this happens, we call break-even point. I will describe in a second why it happens. And we hypothesize that this point exists in training of any deep network. We looked at it, and it seems that this point exists in image net models, uh, in models on text, um, uh, using LSTM on multilayer perception. So going through many architectures, we see the existence of what we call break-even point of the trajectory. Why do we call it break-even point? So let's look at this. Um, three curves. You can see that in all cases, curvature grows initially, um, and then stops growing. So the idea is that curvature grows to this, to this value, the training is very unstable. And we call it break-even point, because in this, in this point, curvature growth stabilizes, uh, meets the instability growth. Or in other words, if curvature would grow just slightly more, training would completely explode. Um, maybe easier to visualize. So let's say we are at point A. This is initialization. No, no one would like to initialize at the point that you explode. I mean, this actually happens, but rarely. So let's say you initialize at the stable point. Then as training progresses to point B, um, so in the middle the, of this figure, uh, you can see that um, training becomes very unstable in the sense that step size you take is actually too large given curvature. 
and then perhaps curvature will drop a bit. So, uh, so to uh, rephrase what I said, the hypothesis is that in any deep network, you initially very quickly go to a region that is extremely unstable, um, and we call this region the break-even point. So we look, as I said, we looked at it and many architectures. Um, due to time constraints, I, I just want to give you some qualitative uh, data for the existence of um, um, break-even point. I will omit more quantitative experiments. Um, so this plot is a bit difficult to um, understand, so let me spend some time. Uh, on y-axis, we have loss. So you can see it is like 2.4 at the highest point, and this makes sense because this is cross entropy on CIFAR 10. So this corresponds to a network that is just random. Axis going towards you is, is time. So it starts with epoch 0 and closest to is epoch 6. If, if you remember, I mentioned that break-even point happens quickly. And now we can see on x-axis projection of the lost surface on one specific dimension. So the takeaway from this plot is that training progresses. And while initially it's very smooth, as I mentioned in the previous slide, all of a sudden we go into this region which is very narrow, and training is very close to divergence. To show that training is very close to, uh, to divergence, we should also talk a bit about the scale. I don't know if you noticed, but on this scale it's, it says k. So k is multiplication of step size. So to visualize what's happening, if you were to take for another experiment, um, trajectory of SGD, what seems to happen is that SGD from the very early on just oscillates in this valley. So it goes to a break-even point where training is very unstable, and this corresponds to oscillation. There was some concurrent work um, that, all, that from completely different perspective shows that training of deep network is very unstable. So if someone in the audience is mathematically inclined, there is a lot of, um, I would say, uh, dynamic uh, system applications to optimization deep learning because there are many oscillations and cycles in the training. Okay. So why is reaching, uh, so I still didn't exactly answer why using a high learning rate improved generalization. If you remember, perhaps I, I said that impro in, it improves conditioning of training and that's already great, but that's all about optimization, not about generalization. So to talk about generalization, I will be a bit speculative here. I hope that's fine. So in our second submission to IQ this year, we talk about stiffness. So imagine you compute gradients on in individual examples. So instead of taking a mini batch, let's say you compute gradient first for the dog, then for the, um, for the horse. These are examples from CIFAR 10. And call the first one G1 and the second one G2. Now, let's think about how these two G1 and G2 are aligned in space. If they're aligned positively in space, which is um, visualized on the right-hand side of this figure, we call that the lost surface is stiff. We call it a stiff because as visualized on the left-hand side, if you improve a bit loss on the first example, it will actually drag the loss on the other example. To use an analogy, if you improve a bit in your mathematics course, then probably you will improve a bit in your physics course. In more deep learning, um, let's say, uh, nomenclature, the representation that you learned is good in the sense that it transfers between examples because you learn a bit on one example and this immediately transfers into an improvement on the other example. In the opposite case, if you have misaligned gradients from individual examples, then improving on one example doesn't improve or even degrades performance on the other. This, I would say, resembles memorization. So maybe uh, some, here, uh, some of you uh, know that um, network, deep networks are, can memorize data, um, and that would correspond to the situation, that example gradients are misaligned or orthogonal. So we experiment with this, but we track a uh, different matrix which is better defined than uh, gradient alignment. It's called covariance of the gradients, or of gradients. So what it is, it's almost the same as gradient alignment, but without normalization, so we take dot product. And when this matrix has a high spectral norm, we expect gradients to be misaligned, like visualized here on the top of the slide. And when, they are, when the spectral norm is low, we expect them to be more aligned, or to have lower norm, because we have no normalization of this matrix. Uh, so if you remember, the, the point was the trajectory for high learning rate is deflected to another part of the lost surface very early on. I told you that it has better conditioning. But we also found out that this spectral norm of k is also lower for high learning rate, meaning that automatically when you optimize with high learning rate, um, 
you reach regions of the loss surface which are in some sense better. And here we mean by better that the gradients have lower uh, variance, which can be interpreted a bit speculatively by this notion of stiffness that I explained uh, to you a bit earlier. So to sum up this new perspective, uh, that's here, right? Um, initially, when you train with two different learning rates, trajectory is unaffected by the learning rate. But r relatively quickly, you reach this break-even point where curvature is very large, and large learning rate just deflects, goes to another part of the uh, loss surface. Um, this is the red dots here. And the idea is that this part of the loss surface is just better. It is better conditioned and has lower variance of gradients. So let's conclude. I promise that I will come back to this um, open challenge, let's say, in uh, deep learning. One of them, there are, m there are quite a few, uh, very challenging things in optimization of deep networks. One of them in particular um, is multitask learning. So imagine you are Tesla, you have many tasks. Um, and here we can calculate gradient alignment, but instead of between examples, let's calculate gradient alignment between tasks. So quite a few concurrent works, it's not from our paper, shows that if you track the gradient alignment between tasks in many, many cases, you, you will find that dynamics are actually not very satisfying. So here we have number of steps on x-axis, and y-axis for yellow, we have just cosine similarity. So minus one means that gradients are exactly contra-aligned. So this is not a productive optimization because, again, optimizing on one task leads to degradation of performance on the other. So you can see that we, if you don't do anything in the case that they studied, gradients uh, iterations oscillate between minus one and one, basically, which s sounds very bad. Their method that they call PCGrad cancels out these oscillations and here I just show their plot where they show they don't have negative alignment, but this also translates quite reliably into improvement of training performance and generalization. Um, I should also say that similar problems arise in other cases, such as multimodal learning, um, also there are related challenges in meta-learning, but I focus only on this one um, uh, due to length of the talk. Okay, so let's uh, sum up. So optimization and generalization are very intrinsically related in deep learning. Um, this is quite different from shallow learning, where if you use, if you optimize towards a good minima, meaning low uh, loss, you should be fine. In deep learning, you actually want to wander ar around. You want to have large noise. We give a new perspective on why this is the case. So we say that if you have high learning rate, you will just go to another part of the loss surface. That is, in some sense, good. And by good, we mean here that you have low spectral norm of the Hessian. So it is, um, let's say, an automagical better conditioning of training under some extra assumptions. And also, you have low spectral norm of the covariance of gradients, which also can be interpreted as better or more transferable features. Um, our next steps for this research is to tackle some of the open challenges, such as multitask learning. Uh, and I also wanted to end up with some practical hints. So I would say that if you optimize any network, um, and this is a well-known trick, but I just wanted to mention it in this context, try to use as large learning rate as possible. This will give you many benefits. And especially try, if, uh, try to use a larger learning rate that then you can use at the initialization by slowly increasing it in the first epoch. This is called warm-up. Second practical hint is that if you use multitask learning, consider tracking um, gradient alignment between tasks you are quite likely to find out that gradients from individual tasks are mi misaligned, which uh, hurts performance a lot. Okay, so that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Stanislav. Do you have any questions to Stasek? Okay. Um, so maybe I missed uh, uh, the, the beginning thing, but uh, what activation functions do you use and what initialization? Right, right. Um, so this seems to be very robust both to architectures and as well initializations and activation functions. So in the, so all plots I have shown, we're using, um, thank you, we're using row activations and as well some of the shelf initialization, but results are not very sensitive to it. Uh, so my uh, question is about the idea of the dynamical isometry. Right. So there is this uh, quite recent, well, uh, uh, 
so my question is about the idea of dynamical isometry. So uh, it is shown that uh, if you use like the sigmoid activation right. functions with the orthogonal initialization, you have this uh, right. this property of dynamical isometry. And I was wondering if, uh, I mean, you try to address you know this kind of right. optimization behavior with. Uh, uh, well, yeah, with this idea, basically. Right, so this is a very good question. So dynamical isometry is, um, is interesting because it gives you dynamical, it gives you dynamical isometry. So for context, dynamical isometry more or less is just that Jacobian is, has, Jacobian of the network, which is very related to the Hessian, um, has, uh, I think, spectral norm of one, or it has all eigenvalues of one. But the interesting thing is that it happens at the initialization, and then we have no guarantees of what will happen during training. And actually, some recent work, as far as I remember, shows that due to, I mean, no, I'm not sure if due to the dynamics like this, but your isometry is very likely to go away if you don't do anything. So um, even though you had isometry at the beginning, due to the fact that curvature, as you have seen quite a lot, evolves during training, unless you enforce uh, isometry at the tr during training, it won't just stick uh, with you. OK, any more questions to Staszek? Thanks for the talk. Uh, how does stiffness change during the training? Like, because you are probably uh, computing the uh, gradient at some particular point to compute right. the stiffness, and I wonder how it changes right, right, during right. the training of the network. Um, so, let's think about stiffness. Um, so, regardless of how it should change, at the end it should be zero, because at minimum all gradients should just flicker around. Um, during training, it's similar to this spectral norm of k, so it goes up and to a larger value for a larger learning rate, um, and then it will decay towards zero, uh, predictably. OK, we have time for one more question. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, expanding your first hint into um, increasing or lowering the right. learning rate during the optimization won't help if uh, we will notice when you have a break-even points. So just modify the <coughs> learning rates when we are approaching break-even points. Won't it solve this problem? Um, sorry, what problem? The changing the learning rates. Um. So we won't have to have single learning rate for a whole problem, but to modify it during the learning. Um. So I'm not sure I understand. Um, so the warm-up learning rate is a well-known trick, which uh, entails just increasing slowly learning rate. Exactly. In initially. So sorry, could you rephrase so your question? Can't we just multiply, um, use it multiple times? So if you would go back to a graph. You uh, mean? No, this one. This one? Yeah, this one. Uh, I believe that you have put uh, three break-even points with uh, dotted lines, right? Um, the dotted lines, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it, mark just uh, accura very low accuracy, so yeah, exactly. to show that all of these effects happen very early on in training. I think it was like 50%. Yeah, so we could change the learning rate three times according to uh, this graph, and every time it would allow us to go higher. Is that correct? Um, so, okay, so not sure if I understand, but first of all, each uh, trajectory has a single break-even point. Exactly. Um, so this one, but oh, I mean, you could go, w w all right, so what you could go say, um, run, I guess, is uh, r uh, use a very low learning rate, get to here, yeah. I mean, and then use a high learning rate, and this, in most cases, will bring you, will jump you to here. Exactly. Right. Um, so. Want to solve it? But, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, uh, what's the problem? Want to solve this problem that you are talking about? Um, sorry, what problem? <laughs> the picking the learning rate. Oh, uh, the so, um, well, it amounts to the same thing. Use the large as you can. So actually, we wouldn't solve it. Because then you, you have to know, OK, now I, I think I understand the question. So the problem okay, so the problem is that you cannot predict what learning rate you will use, mm -hmm. because you want to use the largest that doesn't explode. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is difficult to predict. So, and people, so there, is, there, is, there are very few automatic learning rate tuners. Um, to actually, there are like three submissions on this. And the, at least the one I am looking at, um, is exactly doing what I said, which is use the highest learning rate that doesn't explode, and if you explode, it backtrack. Okay. So I think the answer to your question, which 
uh, sorry, I didn't understand, um, is that it's very difficult to predict what learning rate will explode, so you have to differ, uh, like try a few, uh, empirically speaking, try a few and pick the closest one to divergence. I see. Which is one of these weird effects, because actually it seems weird that you have to use a large learning rate. You should use one that ensures a like, very smooth convergence. I see. Thanks. So let's thank once again. Thank Stasha. you so much. Okay. So now let's invite our next speaker, Przemek Biecek, representative of Samsung, University of Warsaw, Warsaw University of Technology, and maybe also some other organizations. And uh, Przemek will tell you today about explainability of AI. Okay, so I'm the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, mm, I would like to share with you today my interest in two areas. One is AutoML and second is XI, Explainable AI. Uh, why? Why am I going to say about these two things? So, I'm a statistician, so new fancy name for statisticians is our data scientists. Uh, working in different places, but doing the same thing. I'm working with complex big uh, tables. Uh, here we have some examples like genome cancer data sets, well, 8,000 cases, millions of features, uh, PISA data, 2 million cases, thousands of features, complex data sets. Um, I'm working on these data sets since 2003, so 16 years, and I get depressed after, after this time because the progress in this field is very, very small. Uh, actually, maybe you saw this presentation of Brad Victor. Uh, he had similar passion about programming. So if you not saw this presentation, I strongly recommend to, to watch it. It's, it's great. Uh, but after this uh, the passion, I found two areas which I think are interesting. They, they have some uh, very large potential. So this is why I'm going to talk about them. And first of them is explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, why should you care? Why should you care about this? Uh, first is that I guess that most of us think about uh, our job as we are solving some problems and we are de 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 delivering some value. So maybe it is um, hard to see titles, newspapers like that. Machine learning is creating a crisis in science. It's partially true because uh, there's a lot of results that can be replicated. So we have great results like, well, we have new neural network that can detect a cancer and you know, now we, we can treat the cancer, but actually a new group of researchers can replicate the results and it's very, very frequent. Uh, here you have an example of one company, uh, IBM Watson, so probably it's known company. Uh, they win job party and then based on the system they create Watson for oncology. So then they claim that uh, we can support physicians. So unfortunately, last year there was this uh, article and many similar articles like IBM Watson delivers unsafe and inaccurate recommendations. So it's not good. Yeah, lots of people, very talented people, but uh, unfortunately physicians were not happy with, with the, mm, these, these, these results. And it's not only about IBM. I was working for IBM, so maybe I, <laughs> I was biased, but uh, it's similar with other companies. Here we have Amazon. Uh, they created a... Uh, oh, I got they created a system that can screen uh, resumes, CVs, and after four years they said, okay, we will not um, use it because it's biased against women with very tiny, very subtle uh, ways. So against a very large company with lots of resources, lots of very talented people, but then they were unable to actually deliver a product which sounds very easy. Let's get a CV and rank um, CVs from the best one to the worst one. And there's much more problems with that. Um, I have just 20 minutes and 40 slides, so I'm not going for to present all of them. But you can read about lots of them in this beautiful book, Weapons of Mass Destruction, by Katie O'Neill. She was writing about uh, big data, but today you can just replace big data with machine learning and it will be still true. So lots of problems. Can we do something about this? Yes, we can. Actually, now we have newspapers like that. XAI can solve these problems. So, mm, yeah. Let's, let's see how. Uh, I guess that most of you heard about this paper, line. Yeah? Is it true? Uh, I see that lots of people are nodding. Uh, 2016, uh, kind of interesting idea. Let's, let's explain how neural networks are working or black boxes are working in the following way. We have a picture, 
we have a question, whatever is a goose or horse, and now we have a neural network. We need to create some interpolated features. So here there are some separate pixels which kind of identify some regions in the image. And now based on this um, new interpolated features, we can create a simpler model. And the simpler model can be used to explain complex model. So here we have like two possible <coughs> outcomes predicted by uh, VG16 neural network on ImageNet. And the network thinks, OK, maybe it's a poodle, maybe it's goose. And these regions actually convince me that it's more a poodle or a goose. And we can go with following explanations for many different uh, classes. So it looks like a problem solved. Uh, there is a uh, paper, lots of citations, I don't know, thousands of citations in, in three years. Impressive. There is more papers uh, very popular um, as well. Here we have a paper about SHAP, also a very um, known method. Uh, the breakdown is created by my group, and it's not that popular, but still I'm going to show it. So all these uh, results are going to kind of decompose final prediction of model into some uh, pieces that can be attributed to particular variables. Like here we have these three methods, and they are screenshots for, for, for these three methods. We have line, we have some final prediction of a model, model predicts whether some, someone survived or not. And now we can see the different features attribute to the final prediction. A line uh, used this um, surrogate model, kind of linear model, which can be nice approximation, nice local approximation. Sharp uses some may maybe more sophisticated approach. Uh, which is additive, and now we have this eye breakdown method which work, works nicely for non-additive um, models as well. We can look for interactions. So it looks like we have a lot of methods. Actually, I'm, um, I have a, a GitHub um, repository with new articles about XI, and it's like, I don't know, three new papers per week about this, uh, this, this, this discipline, so it's really exploding. Uh, so we, we actually tried to use these methods for physicians. We are collaborating with physicians a lot. So we train our complex model and then show explanations to physicians. Uh, and we were surprised that they, uh, they actually don't um, trust these explanations. Mm. They said that black boxes are explained by other black boxes. Uh, and uh, we are not even closer to, to really understanding what is happening in these, these complex models. And it's because uh, probably our expressions works like that, like we are saying, well, for these inputs, you have this output. And you know, now it's clear how to connect these two things, like 30% yep, of sugar, 20% of eggs, and, and so on, and you have this output. And it's not the way how we would like to understand uh, how mod models are working. We'd like to have uh, better interfaces, which allows you exploring the, the, whole, the whole surface of a model. So what we are doing right now, we are creating different tools that um, support model exploration. So the mm, goal maybe is not to explain anything, because explanation is a very tricky word, but the goal is to <coughs> allow you to explore the model. And uh, after explanation, maybe your understanding will increase. And if your understanding will increase, maybe you will trust, maybe you will think that it's exp explained. But so, so what, what we are doing, again, I'm not going to show you any specific method. Uh, but rather share some interest. So maybe, maybe it will be chaotic, but uh, I hope it still will be interesting. The idea is to create a um, toolbox or methodology that allows you to use any model created in any language, Python, R, whatever. And then with uh, these, these wrappers, you can uh, use tools to, to explore models in a more interactive way. Interactive one word. So to help you understand the process, how to get from the input to the output, we found that it's good to have uh, interactivity. Like, if you have two panels which are interconnected, people can explore your model, and after tries and errors, they can better understand what is happening in the model. So by creating such dashboards and by giving possibility of you know, checking what would happen if I change uh, inputs, then I guess that uh, physicians are more eager to, to, to use a model. So interactive is one word. Uh, descriptive is a second word. We found that actually, no, it may, maybe it will help to understand for you, but uh, some people don't understand charts. <laughs> uh, it's very hard for them to read charts that have more than two dimensions. And so uh, it's a problematic because we see these charts and we believe that these are explanations, but they do, don't know how to read the charts. So we had a very interesting summer project uh, created by Adam um, Izdebski. And uh, he wrote a blog about the projects, uh, actually to 
create a description based on charts. If someone is unsure how to read the graph, because you know it's tricky, there's a lot of uh, elements. Should I focus on this or, or, or other one? It, it's not that obvious. So he created a method that will generate a natural language descriptions for any graph. And then if you are not, if you are sure, whatever you missed something that might be just very important, you can create these descriptions and this will be kind of convincing that, okay, you haven't missed anything. Maybe there are some details, but these are the most important, the key, the key elements, descriptive. Uh, contrastive, so the, the third buzzword is contrastive. It's very hard to understand a model if you don't, if you cannot compare the model against anything. It's much easier if you can have two models and compare models against each other. So we called it mm, champion challenger analysis. When you have some champion in the field, like the best logistic regression model, and then you can create a challenger. And challenger will be uh, this, you know, black box. And now you can see how the black box is working with comparison to the simple model. And then these contrastive expressions, when you can compare something, they are much easier to understand because you have something that you understand and then you can compare this with something that maybe is more tricky. And uh, conversion. Okay. So another student created a crazy project. So like he created a um, Xi chatbot that gives you ability, you can actually go to this website and you can chat, chat with, the, with the chatbot. So you can discuss your chances of survival on, on the Titanic. So it's easy to create a machine learning model for Titanic data, and now you can use this conversation with some system to really explore your chances, what would happen if I'm older, or what would happen if, uh, I don't know, mm, what can happen. People ask a very different questions. We actually do some survey to understand what people are going to ask for, because you know, from the perspective of researchers, it's very easy to find some explanations which are interesting for, for me, but then uh, the question is what people would ask for. So based on the survey, we found out that there are three questions that are the most common, most popular. Why, what if, and what happens to senior uh, passengers. Uh, yeah, so, so then you can um, create a specific answer, answers for, for, these, for these questions. Mm. There were very different questions, uh, like uh, what if I'm an uh, iceberg, but most of these questions were easy to actually address. So, mm, yeah. Uh, these techniques, actually, what is really nice is that they have real-life applications, real-world applications. Again, I'm not going into details. Uh, I will show this presentation, and I hope that some of you will click all these slides. So there was a conference last month about credit scoring, and in credit, credit scoring there is a regulation that you cannot use black boxes because you need to explain customer why credit is given or not given to him or her. Uh, but again, uh, there is some belief that you can use these complex models because they will be better. So we'd like to get this better accuracy. So how to use uh, more complex models, but again, have this explainability. So there are some, uh, some, there are some examples. Uh, this is a presentation. How to use these techniques for credit scoring. Uh, yeah, and it was presented on a conference, so it's kind of real, on a real data set. Uh, I have still a few minutes, so I'd like to share uh, sec uh, my second interest in AutoML. Uh, so there is a survey, uh, and it was the question was like, um, when when will most expert level predictive analytics be replaced by will be automated? And the most common answer was in five five years. So the nice thing is that the survey was taken five years ago. <laughs> so we are in this uh, this moment, yeah, exactly in this moment uh, when it's happening, and really it's happening. This is a screenshot from a blog post by Piotr Polski. He's describing different tools for AutoML. So, you know, AutoKeras, AutoScikit-Learn, these are tools built on top of Scikit-Learn, Keras, and other libraries. What is nice about uh, these tools, um, yeah, they are using different techniques that uh, like Bayesian optimization to, to find the best model. Trying different models, tune different parameters, and, and predict which model would be best for this particular data set. But I like a different approach. Uh, I read this paper a few months ago, and uh, it's kind of uh, very interesting. So I'd like to share my, my, my mm, interest in this paper. Uh, Bern, Bisch, uh, Philip Probst. What they did, they did a very interesting repository of data sets. There is an OpenML initiative, openmap.org uh, uh, website. In this website, you will find like 20,000 different data sets. So a lot of data sets, various sizes. Uh, wide, uh, narrow, long, short, uh, million cases, 100 cases, 
uh, over different data sets and uh, different problems like regression problem, classification problems. And based on these data sets, so what they did actually is they, uh, follow, they found the best optimal default values. Like uh, in this table, you have two columns with default values for different models, different parameters, and they differ, like this is the defaults in the software, and these are defaults which works best for all these 20,000 datasets, or some, some sample from these datasets. So what I say that having 20,000 datasets, now you can see what is working on average or for most of these datasets. So I like this paper a lot. Very nice, thank you. Thanks. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, the, I would like to focus on the first part for a sec. Okay. Um, like the need for explainable models, um, or for explaining how the model behaves, is because the model, uh, for some data point that we didn't encounter before, misbehaves. And I'm wondering whether these types of trying to look into the model and giving some explanation of what the model, how the model is making the decision, is giving the false impression of uh, how the model behaves, but the real test will be whether based on these explanations, people can predict where the model will fail. And um, like, do you do any studies where you know that there's a flaw in the model, and you give these tools to analyze how the model behaves, and try to figure out whether humans using these tools can find the, the breaking points? Yeah. Um. How to answer this question? Um, maybe this way. Uh, I don't like this, this word explain because uh, it kind of uh, shift our um, thinking in a wrong way. Because uh, many different actors will use these techniques for many different reasons. For example, as a model developer, I would be interested in uh, tools that will help me to identify errors and tune the model. And this will be my a goal to, to find the best techniques. So I will use, use for techniques that can um, support my debugging. Look for points with large residuals and understand why these are misbehaving. So the kind of known uh, figure with uh, Husky and Wolf is that you know the ImageNet uh, predicted Husky as a wolf because there is snow um, in, the in, in the background. So this is one interest. Uh, we are looking for points which are um, misclassified in order to improve the model. But another, another perspective is from the people that kind of <coughs> buying our models. Like we, when we are thinking about uh, financial models, um, I, I as a model creator are selling model to a bank and then the data scientists in the bank and they need to audit um, my model. And the auditing is about not about looking for specific cases, they are not looking to debug my model and to improve my model. They would like to check whether my model are um, consistent with some regulations. So it's again different perspective. We can use similar techniques to check whether the model um, is um, kind of complying with fairness or with things like that. And yet another perspective will be a perspective of a physician or customer who actually doesn't is, is not interested in the whether the model is good or not in the general case. Whether the model is the you know have 5% error rate, he is interested in whether the decision for him is the best one. So it's, again, a different perspective. And uh, yeah, mm, it was probably maybe a, <laughs> a long answer, but uh, depending on the perspective, I guess that different methods will be useful or not. Yeah. OK, there's one more question. OK, so I have rather a philosophical question. Okay. Because you like <laughs> explaining models, and you like AutoML. And I wonder whether you shouldn't also explain AutoML, because it seems like oh. you put another you put a black box on the black question. box, and you have two black box. Yeah. Actually, thank you, this is a great question. Uh, we did it. Uh, what we can do, of course, you can try the model to predict the performance of the model. Yeah? So having the data, having the data, you can now train a model like on the forest to, uh, to predict all these performances. And then knowing what with the, what with the performance of the model, you can select the best model. So yeah, and this slide actually is showing for some data set, data set three, three, four, how the model response would behave if we change the node size, for example, or uh, if we change the number of trees. For number of trees, it's more or less obvious that it will not change that much, 
but node size, it looks like it's very sensitive. So, uh, yeah, with larger node size, uh, Rhino Forest model for this data set will have a lower performance. So, exactly, you can kind of uh, do the, uh, how to say it, uh, blended, blended learning where you have human operator and some assistant, automated assistant that, uh, yeah, suggests you which um, models should be checked in the next step. Yeah, so. All right, thanks, Przemek. Do you have any more questions which you would like to ask before the after party? One more, okay. Uh, Przemek, thanks very much for the talk. Just a quick question on, on Otto Amel. In your, um, given your experience and uh, uh, view of what's happening in the industry, which is the most mature Otto ML uh, toolkit at the moment? Out of this? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, we are hiring, by the way. <laughs> mm, yeah. uh, why do I have this list? So, you know, things are changing pretty fast. Like, Autocaras is very, very, um, very, very, very um, new. Uh, actually, I'm my master student, uh, or papa master student, I have to say. <laughs> Our master student did a master thesis about uh, AutoML. And so uh, in uh, his results, Teapot, which is kind of old, it's used in genetic programming, behaves on average in the best way, so it, it gave a pretty good results. Uh, I kind of like um, ML jar, where is ML jar? Here, supervised, because the um, developer is Piotr Płanski. Uh, yeah, he graduated the Universal Restrictive Technology, so a friend of mine, and uh, maybe I'm biased. <laughs> uh, H2O is doing a lot of good things, a good job. So for tabular data, I guess these are very mm, good tool to start with. And uh, it's, again, I think it's open source or something, so you can use it. So yeah, lots of uh, different tools. I would recommend this, this free. But yeah, it might change one month or <laughs> Okay, thanks, Przemek. I see that there's one very important question. Uh, yeah, so so human are black boxes as well. Like, if you train a physician, I guess, yep. well, from my perspective, it's a black box. So now, wh what's the difference? Philosophy part two. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for me, model is not a human. So I will not compare model with humans. Model is rather a tool. So my expectations for tools are different than expectations for humans. I can accept that humans will not be able to explain something. But if I'm using a knife, I get to make sure that I know how to use the knife and what, what may happen. The same with uh, drugs. If I'm using drug, I have much higher expectations for drugs than for physicians. So, yeah, that will be the answer. Like, uh, it's okay for me that uh, cats are not explainable and humans as well, but uh, for tools, uh, in my toolbox, my expectations are much higher. That's what you want to do. We want to have a, an ML model that is actually a physician. No, no. no. Uh, I, d I don't. <laughs> like, I believe that uh, we are not going, it would be sad for me at least, to play statisticians. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, I believe that we can actually create these models to support statisticians. Like, uh, no, our job right now, my job is very boring because I need to do all these technical things uh, with, with tunings, manual tuning of hyperparameters. So these tools are useful to support my job, make it more interesting. It will be, human will be still in, uh, important, but I would like to um, focus on, on this part. Validation, justification, not spend time on, on this part, so. What I'm trying to say yeah. is that you, like, human, like physicians, they also need to support their, um, their decisions. Yeah. And, and when you train a physician, Somehow we are able to say, so you are trained good enough, you can actually treat people. So there is a lot, th there are parallels here. And yeah. I, I wonder, like, I can't tell you like, yeah. what's the answer, but like, I, I wonder whether we can use this knowledge, how people, uh, how people learn, how we validate whether a physician is good enough or not to train models. Yeah. Why, why, why there is a difference? This is, uh, yeah. I prefer to think about these models as a, as black tests, blood, blood tests. 
So results from blood tests are delivered to physician, and physician is um, having the decision. Uh, so results from model are delivered to physician, and physicians make the decision. I would not like to replace the physician with models. Lots of problems. So yeah, maybe it will be more effective, like with autonomous cars. Yeah, but uh, I prefer to think about this um, cohabitation or supporting each other. Augmented analytics is analytics that support human, not replace human. It's actually my talk um, uh, was supposed to be named human-oriented analytics. Analytics that can support human, but human is in the middle. Again, philosophy, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, Przemek. I know the discussion is very interesting, but I see that the pizza is waiting for you and the uh, beer is waiting as well. So, sorry, Matthew, I will not allow any more questions now. But I hope that uh, Przemek will stay with us for the after party so you can also ask uh, more questions. Um, so, let's uh, thank Przemek once again for the <laughs> talk. Okay. Uh, so, that was the last uh, lecture today. Uh, I had several more slides, but uh, I think that we can skip it. I just wanted to <laughs> tell you that uh, <laughs> that uh, the Warsaw AI will return for sure. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, see some interesting links to our Facebook groups, mailing list, YouTube channel, etc. Uh, we want to thank Google once again for uh, helping us organize this event and for the uh, for the catering for the during the after party. Yes, we will return. Uh, we expect that the next event will happen in December, just before Christmas, but we'll uh, uh, announce it later, so stay tuned. And so, thank you once again uh, for attending this event. Thanks once again to our great speakers. And it's time for after party. Thank you.